Well, I'd like to welcome everyone here today again. And uh, we're going to be kind of tagging on to what we looked at last week. Um, there will be a, a little bit of overlap because that's just the way it works. Everything overlaps. So uh, before we start, let's ask for some guidance as we go through here. Father in heaven, we come before you this Sabbath and we praise you for it. Who knows what we'd be doing if you did not have this commandment for us to get to know you. And we ask as we look at your word, as we encourage each other, we pray that your spirit will lead us and guide us into all truth. And show us some things that are to come. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, so last week, I don't know if anyone remembers, we've been talking about uh, the prophecies around that revolve around the second coming, the millennium, and what happens at the end of the millennium in the judgment. We covered that pretty, pretty carefully, and we've been looking at how Revelation overlaps. Certain, certain places in Revelation, we seem to have a repeat and enlargement and this is the beauty of it, is that we pick up the data here and there and put it all together, and it gives us a much more complete story. And why is that important? The more we understand God's plan and how he has acted and reacted uh, in the history of his creation, it gives us a better understanding of his character. If we're going to um, submit to his authority uh, for eternity, we're going to have to understand who we're submitting to. So there's no better way to do it than to look at the history, how he has um, acted in the past on man's behalf, against man, if you will, in some cases, and show how this is how he's going to act and uh, react in the future. So we don't really have anything to fear. Of course, this old saying, we don't have anything to fear for the future, except we forget how God has led in the past in his teachings and how he has acted and reacted with man. So we're going to look at today, we're going to have to look at some history of how God has dealt with mankind. And we're going to see in the future how he's going to do, you guessed it, he's going to act exactly the way he has in the past. And that's how we know uh, that we can trust him because he does not change. Now with this topic, there is the idea out there, and I, I know people, uh, some, I know some of these people very well, and they have this idea that God's not willing that any perish, so that they have this idea that no one would be destroyed in, in the end, is that God's going to bring everyone to repentance, because that's his will, and he's not willing that any perish, and because God gets his way all the time, uh, everyone will be saved. This, this idea, I do not believe, can be supported from Scripture. It is not God's will that any perish. He didn't make man to burn. That's not why he created him. He created man to give him glory and to glorify his character. And how does man glorify his character? but being like him. So if we become like him, we will glorify him by our works. This is how we glorify God, by the way we act and react with other people. This is how we do it. And so in order to know how to do that, we need to know how he acts and reacts with people, and then we need to follow that pattern that he's laid down. So... There's some, um, the other idea is, is that God cannot destroy the wicked, not because he cannot, but that he will not. 
because there is a law that says thou shalt not kill. And therefore, if God killed the wicked at the time of the end, then he would be breaking his own law. Now we're going to we're going to look at that concept today and and I believe while there are truths contained with that concept the actual end conclusion I believe to uh, be incorrect and we're going to look at that um, that today we're going to try and look at this really carefully so we can see that um, God's hand actually is being forced. So Satan has been warring against God for we don't know how long, and he's pushing people into a direction, and it's like his hand is being forced. We can see this in governments. We see two sides developing in the world, and we see that hands are going to be forced in a certain direction to respond in a certain way. And uh, we're going to see that play out right in front of us here fairly shortly in time. Uh, I believe during the next year we're going to see some things happen that are going to shock us to the core. And they will help us actually. These things that are going on right now are helping us to get on one side or the other. When evil is manifested, to, its, to the extent that it's going to be manifested, it will force people to be on one side or the other. And that's, that's God's plan. Well, in the overall scheme of things, God, God's hand is being forced to act. And we're going to look and see how this is all being developing in Scripture and how this thing all unfolds. That's what we want to look at. My personal belief is that, and we're going to get there, but just to give you an idea of where we're going, is my personal belief right from out of the gate in the Garden of Eden, when God said, you shall surely die, that death that he was talking about, I believe to be the second death, although it doesn't say the second death, that's the death that he said, if you hang on to your sin and be unwilling to change, you shall surely die. And then when we get to the end of the book, we see that death. It's called the second death. And that's the death that there is no recovery from, no redemption from. That's when everything is made new after that happens, after the fire that it says comes down and destroys all those that we're unwilling to follow God and uh, throughout eternity. And that's where we're going to end up, and we're going to go and we're going to demonstrate how he has acted throughout Scripture to lead him to the place where he will do what he needs to do in, in the very end of things. So, we have a rule, and it goes like this. It is written... Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 4, we know who said that. But we know that he was quoting from Deuteronomy. So this was Yeshua stating this. This has to be our rule of faith. We don't want to use psychology or any, you know, man's devising of what the truth may or may not be. We're going to go to the Word and the Word only to find out this, uh, the answer to these questions that we're looking at. Well, we have two main questions. The first one, the overall setting here, does God have a limit to his patience? Can you see this here? I would propose that God's patience is coming to a close. It will have a little interruption, and then through the millennium, at the end, 
his patience will come to a close, and the cup of indignation will be full, and his wrath will overflow, and uh, God will restart, give a reboot to this planet wherein righteousness will dwell. So in order for that to happen, the wicked and all those that want to hang on to their deeds, which were shown in Revelation, we looked at that last week, when the cup of God's patience is full, he will act and it will end. All things that have happened will end. We're even promised, which is a great promise, that even the memory of them will perish, and that's the wicked. And so the glories that will follow the recreation will be so great that we will not be able to call to mind the things of the past. Now, it's quite interesting. When I lay, ba lay awake sometimes in bed, and I'm sure you guys have had this experience because I find that my experience is what a lot of people have, is there are things in my life unless triggered specifically, that I just can't remember. I can't remember the details. And, and that's because my mind has been so focused on other things, one would be the Bible and truth, is that those things in my past are, are gone. They're even gone from my mind. I believe this is how it's going to happen at the time of the end when it says the memory of them will perish and we won't even be able to call to mind the evil that has transpired that, that possibly we were even involved in because of the glories that will follow, because of the, the new creation that God makes. It will be so glorious that the past will be completely forgotten. I don't know about you, but that is really good news for me. Anyone think that's good news? That's good news. I would just soon not remember some of the things that I have been involved in in the past, and I'm sure maybe there are a few out there that would say the same. So how does he execute punishment? Well, there's one way that he executes punishment, and that is that he removes his protection. Now that's, that's pretty clear in scripture. When Israel was doing evil, participating in the worship practices of the world, he either inspired, and we, we don't really know exactly how this works, he either inspired uh, Nebuchadnezzar to come down on Israel and destroy, uh, destroy Israel and take them captive, or he just withdrew his presence from Israel, which left a void, uh, and the king of Babylon came and destroyed and took them captive, made them surrender to him. We haven't got the exact details on how that all happened, but definitely he removed his protection. Now, we can go look in the book of Deuteronomy and all the promises, the blessings, they're called, and the cursings that would follow. So in Deuteronomy, it says that if Israel had remained faithful, then God would protect them. There would never be an army that would come in and destroy them. And so the obvious thing to me is they weren't faithful. And so God allowed the armies to come in, uh, withheld his protection from them, and, uh, and Israel was destroyed. And we see this throughout history. This is, this is a running commentary uh, in Kings and Chronicles. It just shows the history, and, and we're, all, we're all totally aware of that. The same thing could be said at the time of Yeshua when the Son of God himself came to his own and his own received him not and they chose another king, Barabbas, if you will, which is also called Son of Papa. Very interesting. They chose a counterfeit Messiah and, um, and we know what happened after that. So God again withheld his protection Judgment was meted out on Israel, 
And this is how God gets the job done in some cases. But there are some cases in Scripture, and uh, I just want to say in, in, in regard to uh, point A, he removes his protection. This is not how he acts all the time. There are instances when he does that, and there are instances when he takes it upon himself and acts for himself. In other words, nobody can get the job done the way he's going to get it done. And so he takes the reins into his own hands, and he takes it upon himself to do what he needs to do. That no one can get this wrong. So Peter, what does Peter tell us here? 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. In other words, if you remember everything I, or if you forget everything I told you, don't forget this. That with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Now, I don't want to prove anything that this text is saying when it isn't saying. What this is saying is it's talking about time in regard to God. Time is irrelevant. Whether a day goes by or a thousand years go by, in God's mind, it's as a day. So a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. Time is irrelevant to a God that lives the past, the present, and the future. He sees it all at one time. I don't know how he keeps it all straight, but I have the assurance that he does. In, in uh, verse 9, he goes on to say, And the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any perish, but that all should come to repentance. So what I believe that Peter is saying here is that some people were wishing that God would set up his kingdom right away. And this is, this is in the New Testament. It's very clear that they were expecting the kingdom to be set up. And even, even after the, the time that the disciples had spent with Yeshua, they asked him, will you at this time uh, give the kingdom back to Israel? And then he explained, well, it's not for you to know, actually, uh, what the Father has in his own authority. And so we are promised that one day God will do what he needs to do. But he's putting that off because he does not want anyone lost. There is a time coming in earth's history when everyone on this planet will have made a decision for truth or lies. And it's not until that time comes that he cannot close the curtain on this plan that he has. Everyone has to have opportunity to hear. And that's God's justice. Because when he does what he needs to do, it has to be proven that he could do nothing else to save another soul. And that's, that's where we're going very quickly to the place where he's going, his hand will be forced because everyone will have made their decision for eternity or for uh, eternal destruction. So God is waiting for that time which he alone knows. The time will come when the declaration will be made by the king. Then, the sh then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then he will say unto, also unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into etern the eternal fire, which is prepared for the devil and his angels. We covered this a little bit, but it really plays into this segment in the destruction that's going to come upon the world at the end of the millennium is that God at the end of the millennium is about to recreate this world in which righteousness will dwell. 
But before he does that, those that are risen in the second resurrection, which we looked at last week, and if you haven't seen that presentation, you really need to see that, because this is building on that. So at the end of the second resurrection, or when the second resurrection happens, Satan goes out to deceive the nations again. This is the resurrection of the unrighteous. This is the resurrection of John chapter 5 that Yeshua spoke about, a resurrection of righteousness and a resurrection of the unrighteous. The resurrection of the unrighteous is the second resurrection, which there is no power. Why is there no power from the second resurrection? Because the second resurrection does not bring it with it eternal life. The second resurrection brings with it the second death because they are raised to judgment. And this destruction that Yeshua talks about here, the fire that has been prepared, has not been prepared for men. You see, men were given a special opportunity, if you will, because they weren't in the presence of God. They did not... They did not turn their backs on their creator in his presence, in the glory of the heavenly kingdom. So they, it would seem, were granted um, a time of probation, if you will, a time in which they would be able to see God in all of his glory, in the works and in the way that he has treated man throughout history. And, of course, the prophets would give greater insights into what happened prior to the creation of this world. So we would be able to get a picture of the character of God, a picture that we would be able to, with an intelligent decision, decide whether we wanted to follow God and his ways throughout eternity, or we would turn our backs on him and we would choose, that's the main, the main idea, we would choose not to follow God because righteousness is not in our makeup any longer because we've turned our backs on righteousness and chosen to do evil to the point where our minds are hardwired in our evil and there is nothing more that God can do for us. And we have, in a sense, the wicked will have forced the hand of God to the place where he's got to clean up the mess and start the whole thing over again. And we can rest assured that this is not going to happen uh, another time because we're told that affliction will not rise up a second time. So it will be eternal glory from there on in. And that, to me, is part of the gospel. And that's the good news, is that God is going to deal with sin. But this text, what Yeshua is trying to demonstrate here is because the angels sat in the presence of God, saw all that he has created. And when I look up at the stars and I, I see all of that, and I can only see small snippets of what is out there, I believe, uh, I believe a lot of things that are out there that we have no idea. And the angels and Satan were privy to all of God's creation, and they turned their back on him. They were warned, I believe, that God had warned them where this would end up, down the road, when there would be a fire that would totally consume the devil and his angels, and we have been warned ahead of time that if we choose to follow Satan and his angels, the end result where they are going to uh, end up will be our fate as well. This is also part of the gospel in that we know that unrighteousness will, lot, will not live throughout eternity. It will be brought to a close. And all those that decide to follow Satan and continually to be deceived by him will end up with the same fate. We want to notice that God has warned us ahead of time uh, that this is going to happen. He has told us well in advance. So what should that do for us? Well, it should motivate us. Um, some people have been motivated to the place where they believe, well, 
if God, if you don't follow God and do exactly as he has said, then he's going to destroy you. You know what? That is completely the wrong way to look at this, but that's part of the deception of Satan. The actual reality is this, is God is not willing to watch suffering and affliction on men throughout all eternity through his, uh, on his creation. So he's going to bring this to a close, but not until everyone has had opportunity to follow him. And this is what Yeshua referred to in Matthew 24 when he said, This gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom being restored, which also includes the destruction of unrighteousness, that's part of the gospel. So when this gospel has gone to all the world and everyone has had opportunity to choose righteousness and turn from wickedness, then he will bring it to a close. But it's not until that happens that he's going to bring this to a close. Demonstrating, demonstrating in my mind, the righteousness and the fairness of our creator. Peter goes on to say, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, by the word of God, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. In the ASV, the American Standard Version, this word perdition is kind of confusing unless you've looked that up. Uh, there, there needs to be some clarity here. But the heavens that are now, or that now are, and the earth by the same word have been stored up for fire, being reserved against the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So this idea that God is going to torture people forever is, is not scriptural, although there are verses in the Bible that seem to indicate that. But what is the forever part of the destruction is that life will not exist past the destruction that God has reserved for the fire until the day of judgment. And this, of course, is talking about the, ju the judgment at the end of the millennium when the fire comes down out of heaven from God and consumes the wicked that want to hang on to their wicked ways. And that's very clear in, in Revelation chapter 20 through 22. So the heavens that, are, that now are and the earth by the same word have been stored up for fire. So if we're going to, God's going to clean up all unrighteousness in the world, the elements, he goes on to say, will melt with fervent heat. He's going to clean up all the destructive ways and things that the wicked have done on this earth and start again. But if those people, the people that have done the wicked ways, don't turn from their unrighteousness and hang on to them after the second resurrection, they will be consumed in the fire that was specifically to clean up the world and to destroy the angels um, and we don't want to be involved in the same fate uh, that the evil angels and the world and the heavens uh, will be consumed in. The question regarding the destruction of all sin and sinners involves an aspect of God's character. Exodus 34, 6 and 7 tell us, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth. Now, we could just leave this here, and this just sounds beautiful, and we can come up with all kinds of conclusions on what this is saying. It's talking about God is love. No question about that. It goes on to say, keeping mercy for thousands. That lends to the idea that God is love. Forgiving iniquity, God is love, and transgression and sin. By no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now, if we take this just for what it says, it's kind of interesting, is that God only carries on 
the iniquity of the fathers until the fourth generation. Of course, we know that's not true. If the generations that follow a wicked generation don't turn from their error and their unrighteousness, the, uh, the iniquity will be visited upon as many generations throughout eternity, if time went that far, uh, upon the children and the children's children until the third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh generation. It just means that unless there is a turning, a forgiving of iniquity and transgression, God will not clear the guilty. In other words, the guilty ultimately are going to pay for what they have done. And they will pay with their lives because sin and iniquity is not sustainable. You know, we talk about uh, sustainability uh, by the left and by the right. The left does not seem to realize because they have left their heritage, they have left their Judeo-Christian values, and they've thrown God out of the picture. Their idea of sustainability with the wokeness that's going on, and you, you all know what I'm talking about there, it is not sustainable. One of the reasons it's not sustainable, if you have two men marrying each other, can they have children? <laughs> well, the answer to that question is pretty obvious. If, if we uh, did that as human beings, and we all decided to live according to that rule, it's not sustainable. I understand unless, unless a group of people, i.e. the United States, Europe, the populations, if they do not have two plus children, it's not sustainable. And so uh, the left, their ideas are not sustainable. And you can look through that and see how all these ideas that they have are basically because they've thrown God out and they have become their own gods and they think that they're smart enough to make a decision on what is sustainable and what is not. And of course, when we look at the Bible, we can see that their ideas are not going to live throughout eternity, but they will be brought to an end when the cup of God's mercy is filled and it becomes time for him to act. His mercy does have a limit. So what about God's character? God is love. Does his infinite love allow him to destroy those whom he loves? Now, does God only love the righteous? Well, in Hebrews, it tells us that he loved, who, Jacob, but hated Esau? Was it Esau's works that he hated and it flowed over into Esau? And this is, this is really what was going on there. Where do we look for answers? Well, there's a few places we can look, the historical record, so we can see how God has acted and reacted in the past. We can also look to prophecy. Prophecy uh, is indicated the the way that prophecy is going to be played out is going to be exactly the way God has acted in the past. So this is how we know the, the prophetic record is true because God is consistent and he will do exactly the way he has acted in the past. In fact, the historical record is an indicator of what the future holds for us. Also in the sanctuary service, uh, we see prophecy as well. And some people, well, how do you mean? Well, we know that the festival calendar is a prophetic picture of how God is going to play out the future. And, then, and uh, we can look at the past and see that. We look at the past record in the sanctuary, and it will help us as we look forward to the sanctuary service, how it will be fulfilled in the future. One of the very simplest ways you can, you can do this is look at the Passover. Paul says that Christ is our Passover. He's our lamb that took upon him the sins of the world. And when we accept him as our Passover lamb, it tells us something. He, will, he has delivered his people in the past because he is the Passover lamb. 
He's also the Passover deliverer, and we can know and rest assured that he will deliver us in the future. We also know that he is our judge. He has made judgments in the past, and the results of that judgment have been made manifest in the past, and that's how we know that he's our judge in the future, and Scripture tells us that he is the judge, and he will execute uh, judgment in the future. So the sanctuary service, where do we see the future laid out? The ultimate destruction of the wicked and all sin is laid out in the sanctuary as well. Where is it laid out in the sanctuary? Well, when the sins were brought by the sinner and he laid his hand on the lamb and the, the transfer was made so the sinner was able to be free from sin because he had transferred his sins onto the lamb. And then the lamb had to be killed. Very interesting here. I asked the question, who kills the lamb? Well, in some cases, the sinner kills the lamb, showing that we're ultimately responsible for the death of Yeshua. But in some cases, the high priest kills the lamb as well. So these were, these were agents that God used uh, for the destruction of sin. But it doesn't stop there. Where, uh, where was the lamb placed after the sin was placed on the lamb? The sin, um, the lamb was, was killed. I, never, I have never seen anywhere in scripture that a lamb, a live lamb, was placed on the altar, a burnt offering, and burned alive. You see, that's what Satan did to the righteous. He would burn them alive at the stake. That was a twist, a twisting, if you will, from the truth. The reason why Satan, that was his, one of his favorite things, is to burn the saints alive at the stake, is because that is the, that is the actual penalty of the sins of those that have followed Satan. They will be burned at the end. The only difference is, I'm not so sure if we look at the sanctuary service that they are burned alive in the time of the end. I don't know how exactly that's going to happen. But what we do know is that sin and sinners will be consumed in the fires of destruction in the time of the end. The Bible is very, very clear on that. If we look at some history, we see something very interesting in the time of the flood, which we're going to look at here. We're going to look at the time of the flood. The wicked were destroyed in the flood. Noah and his family got on the ark, but the wicked were destroyed in the flood. How did that flood come about? And were the wicked all dead when the water came upon the earth? That's kind of a good question. It would seem, by the way the story goes, that those who had the breath of life that weren't inside the ark died in the flood of waters. They lost their breath, their life, through the flood of waters. It could be that God has chosen another way to destroy the wicked, and it could be that he takes the breath of life away in the fires of destruction in the time of the end. So we want to look at how this has all happened in the past, and it will give us a view on how he's going to do this in the future. Genesis 2, 16 and 17 tell us, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. We know they didn't die at the time when they ate of the tree, but I would suggest that their death sentence was certain. They would not only die the first death, but they would also die the second death if they did not return back to God after they sinned in the garden. And they would be given their life to make that determination 
who they were going to serve. Were they going to serve Satan and his agents, or were they going to serve God and his agents, which are the angels, which we would have as a help through this time that we're living in, we're told that the angels are ministers for those that are going to inherit eternal life. Those would be the good angels. And they come to us, although we can't see them. In most cases, we, we don't see them. I believe they whisper things into our ears, good things into our ears, and they draw us to, to God. That is their work in this plan. So we will eat of the tree of knowledge, and that's why death has come upon uh, all men, because we have all eaten from that tree of good and evil, and we've been partakers of that. Then the Lord saw, Genesis 6, 5, moving forward, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You see, what I was saying here is there's a time when God will take the reins into his own hands, but he waits until the cup is full, the cup of iniquity in the sinner. And this is what happened at Genesis chapter uh, 6, verse 5. And we're going to see something here very interesting. This was only 1,500 years after the creation, approximately 1,500 years after the creation, when man had been become so evil that God had to act on behalf of who? On behalf of those of the righteous. And that's when the cup is full. We have a group of people that are righteous, and a group of people that are unrighteous. And unrighteousness had taken hold of all those on the earth. You know, God in the beginning told, uh, told Abra or Adam, sorry, God in the beginning told Adam that he would have to eat in the garden, he would have to take care of the garden, and he would sweat. And that's how he would be able to, to survive. And over time, it became very apparent that it was going to be more difficult all the time as this thing goes forward for us to survive. And we can see that today is it looks like there is becoming two groups, those that serve and those that rule over those that serve. And uh, this is kind of the way it was in the time of the flood. And there, we're moving forward to a time when every intent of the thoughts of the hearts of men will be on evil continually. In other words, their minds had been so hardwired into only doing evil and doing good never entered their thoughts. It was at this time when God said what he was going to do. Genesis 6, 7 to 9. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created. Now, I know what people say about this is that God was just going to withhold his protection and man would just destroy, they would all fight together and just destroy each other. But this is not what this is saying. This says, I will destroy man whom I have created. So he's put, in, put two thoughts together. Who was it that created man? Well, it was God that created man. So he claims that he is the creator and in the same verse, he says, I am the destroyer of man. That doesn't mean that he's the destroyer. Satan is the destroyer. But when God's mercy, when man has determined that he will have uh, demonic forces rule over him, there is no more good in man and man will come to the place where he has filled his own cup. 
and God will be left with no other choice but to destroy man. Because all that's coming out of this is suffering, pain, and death. And there is a point when God will act on behalf of those that choose righteousness instead of evil. And the point of that is when man has determined to do evil and determined not to turn from it. God says here in Genesis chapter 6, 7 to 9, that I will destroy man. I want you to count the places in these next texts that God says that he will do it and no one else will. But Noah found grace er, in the eyes of the Lord, Jehovah. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. So God was not going to destroy Noah because Noah was righteous. And so God makes a difference for those he's going to destroy. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them from the earth. So God is showing us why he's going to do this, because the earth is filled with violence. The earth being filled with violence does not glorify God. And so the end of all flesh came before him because the earth was filled. Not quarter filled, not half filled, not three quarters filled, but it was filled. All the intents of the hearts of man was on evil continually. And he said, at this point, I can't handle this any longer. Uh, I would suggest that Noah and his family would be coming under attack very soon if they had not come under attack soon. I believe that Noah was most likely being mocked for his choices in life, that he would serve God. And uh, he was next on the block of the wicked. And uh, God said, no longer. Genesis 6, 17 and 18. And behold, I myself... Number three now, I myself am bringing a floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which the breath of life, everything that is on the earth shall die. Now, I ask the question, who is the author of life? Who breathed into Adam the breath of life? Well, the, the answer is God, of course, probably in the person of Yeshua, is that God breathed into Adam the breath of life. It had come to the place where God was going to remove the breath of life from man. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever been underneath the water? Has anyone ever pushed you underneath the water and you're gasping for your breath? You see, your breath is going out of your body. That's what happens when you're put under water unwillingly, unwillingly and you don't have a chance to hold your breath. Is that God was going to bring a flood of waters upon the earth and destroy all flesh. How? He was removing the breath of life from these individuals and this brought death. And that's how he destroyed uh, man from the earth. He says, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, your sons, wives with you. For after seven more days, I will cause, who will cause? I will cause it to rain on the earth. The devil didn't have anything to do with this. God takes full responsibility for his actions and he says I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made I don't know is this number five where God says I will do something in one case he said I myself when it says I myself that's a good indication that he's not going to let anyone else do this. 
And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. See, this is how, this is Noah's out. He obeyed the Lord all the way. And this is how he was perfect in his generations. And he did not suffer the brunt of the destruction of the wicked. Genesis 7, 10 through 12 tells us, And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth, just as God had said. And the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. And we're not going to get into the how of this because scripture doesn't tell us the how, but there are ideas out there of how this has happened. Um, and I do not believe, my personal opinion is, that Satan did not break the windows of heaven and break up the fountains of the deep. God said that he had done this. And the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And they went into the ark uh, to Noah, two by two. This is talking about the animals now. And all flesh in which is in it is the breath of life. So that they, or they entered, male and female, of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now this is really kind of neat, because the ark is a type of the provision that God has made to save us. That ark can be the Lamb of God. Ultimately, it will be at the second coming of Yeshua, when we are taken to the Father's house and God takes us out of this world to the Father's house and that becomes our ark of safety, if you will, for a thousand years. And then that ark of safety, the New Jerusalem, comes down out of God and we see the ultimate destruction of all sin. And I would propose that it's similar to the way that he destroyed mankind uh, at this time that we're talking about at the time of the flood. And we can see that as we move forward. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. So ultimately, the water was upon the earth for longer than a person, if they time, climbed to the tallest tree at that time, at the top of the mountain, they would uh, probably die of starvation because of the flood lasted so long. But really, what it's trying to show us is no one survived this other than those that were on the ark. This is history. This is how God has worked in the past when man's hearts were on evil continually. And I would propose that God is going to act in a similar manner as he has acted in the past when man has consumed his mind on evil continually. Verse 21, chapter 7 tells us, And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And every man goes on in, 27, uh, in chapter 7, 22, 24. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life, the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on dry land died. This is our Father in heaven taking back what he gave, the breath of life, that is his to give, he took it back because those that had accepted it, those that were living, rejected the God who gave them life. And so he just took back what was rightfully his uh, to begin with. Verse 23, so he destroyed all living things. Who destroyed? He destroyed, God destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping things, and birds of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. I had someone tell me, I was questioning them, why 
does the, why does the Bible seem to be so clear that it was God? I think it's seven times that it's said that God did this. He didn't leave it to someone else as he does at times. He did not leave this to someone else. He did it himself. And it was explained to me that it wasn't really God that was destroying man. Is what happened was the sins of the world became so heavy on the earth that it broke up and the waters of the earth came up from the bottom and man died because of the flood that came upon the earth. It's just too bad we don't have a scripture that explains it like that. And that's where human uh, psychology and philosophy and we use all these things to determine that it's not possible for God to destroy the wicked. But I would like to remind ourselves that we have only scripture to back up these points that we're trying to make. Human philosophy has to be gone. Human philosophy can turn a lot of things into what the word does not say if we just focus on that. But if we focus on what the word says, it's very, very clear that God has a limit to his patience and his limits are righteous. And the waters prevailed uh, on the earth 150 days. Goes on in Genesis 8, 20, 22. Then Noah built an altar unto Jehovah and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And Jehovah smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imaginations of man's heart is evil from its youth nor will I gain des destroy every living thing. Key here, as I have done. How did he do it that time? It was by a water. We know that at the end, it will be fire that consumes the wicked. He doesn't say he will never again destroy man, whose thoughts have been evil continually. He just says, I'm not going to do it the same way as I have have done. That's very clear here. Also, I just want to go back to the beginning of verse 21 and make sort of a, uh, an understanding of this that I have gained through the sanctuary. When the Lord smelled a soothing aroma, what was he smelling? Does God like the smell of burning flesh? I would propose that in the sanctuary, God is not impressed with the burning flesh. What he's impressed with is what the burning flesh symbolizes. And what the burning flesh symbolizes when he puts an offering on the altar, it's the final consuming of all sin. That's what the sanctuary is pointing forward to. Anytime that the sacrifice was burnt on the altar, it represents the final destruction of all sin. And that's what was sweet to God's uh, smelling. It's what it represented. So I would propose that God is not impressed with our barbecues or referring to the altar as a barbecue, which I have heard it referred to. The altar is not a barbecue. It's a picture of what is going to happen in the time of the end when God burns up all sin and those who hold on to it at the very end in the destruction of all wicked in that fire that is prepared for the devil and his angels. In verse 22, we go on to say, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So God says, I will destroy at the end, but while the, the earth remains, we're going to have seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night. These were the changes in God's creation after we came out of the flood. There were radical changes in, uh, in God's way of doing things. 
So what I believe out of what this text says, in the beginning of creation, you could have planted a seed any time in the year and you would have a harvest at a certain amount of time depending on which seed you planted. But after we came out on the other side of the flood, radical changes in this planet and the atmosphere when the windows of heaven were broken and the waters came down, there was a radical change that happened on this planet and Noah was introduced to the major changes that would happen. There would be a time when he would have to plant certain seeds or he would not have a harvest. There was going to be cold and heat, winter and summer, and we today feel the brunt of that. I believe when the earth is made new, we are not going to have winter and summer as we know it today. It will be much, much different. Even day and night will be much different in the new earth. We're told that in the city, at least in the city, when the kingdom comes down, is there will be no night there. In other words, it's going to be day all the time. That's going to be wonderful. And uh, we may not have to ever sleep. These are all promises of the gospel. These are all things that people are saying no to without actually understanding what the gospel has. It behooves us to take a good, long look at the promises of the gospel because it's the promises of the gospel that will keep us on the straight and narrow as time progresses. And we can see that Peter tells us that we have such great and precious promises that we can become part of the divine nature. Yeshua became part of the divine nature and that led him to living a life that glorified God every minute of the day. And that's why we have all these promises, so that we can live the life that Yeshua lived so in order to glorify God. So this is, this is why we have all this information, so that we can get on the right side of things here. Luke 17, 26 and 27 and as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Well, what was it like in the days of Noah? Well, man's hearts were continually on evil. So what did God do about it? Well, we look at the history, we can see what God did about it then. So I would propose if the circumstances before the flood were attained then God would act the same way as he did at the time of the flood. And we see that, Revelation 19, you want to have a good long look at Revelation 19, and it's going to show you what's going to happen when Yeshua returns. In verse 27, Luke goes on to, uh, in his record, which are the words of Yeshua, they ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Now, we have the record, who brought the flood upon the earth? Obvious question, when we go back to scripture and have a look, we know that God brought the flood upon the earth. It was the flood that destroyed them all. So who destroyed the people at the time of the flood? The answer has to be is God destroyed the people at the time of the flood. So if it's going to be like the days of Noah and man's hearts will be evil continually, then who is going to destroy the people when Yeshua returns? Obvious answer is God does not change. He acts the same way as he has acted in the past. The, this record of how Noah brought um, was brought into the ark. God did not destroy the righteous and the wicked together, but saved the righteous out of the destruction of the wicked. This is how we know that God is going to save the righteous in the time of the end. So what should we do? We should get on the side of the righteous and start to learn about God and his goodness and his love and his plan of salvation. And when we do that, we draw closer and closer 
and closer to him till we reach the decision that we would never turn our backs on him. You see, that's the gospel message, is to know so much about God and how he acts and reacts, is that we would forever make a decision that we would never turn our backs on him. And it is at that point that we, he will come to receive his own. What goes with that is when man's hearts, the other side of that coin, when man's hearts are on evil continually and they have decided forever to reject God and his ways, it will be at that time that he will come, receive his own, put them into his ark of safety, and destroy those as he destroyed those in the time of the flood. The Bible is extremely clear on this point. To come up with any other conclusion than this is to go against Scripture. And we know we cannot do that. Scripture has to be our bottom line for all understanding that we have. 2 Peter 2, 4 and 5. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. This is very interesting. God has held in check, if you will, the angels and has reserved them for judgment. Well, we're going to see something here very interesting. The righteous are going to be able to judge these angels and going to be able to pronounce sentence on these angels for what they have done. God has asked us to do this, and we're going to see those texts as we go. But God didn't spare them, and he cast them down to hell, delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. This is what Yeshua spoke about when he said that the angels, that there's a special fire reserved for them, and they will be cast into this fire, talking about the exact same event that Yeshua spoke about as we looked at earlier. He did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. I want to ask you, how many people, I just read it, how many people were preserved in the ark eight now evidently they had qualified to be preserved into the ark noah's sons and their wives and noah's wife listened to him and decided it would be safer in the ark than outside the ark and they were saved in that in that flood that came upon the world the wicked we know what happened they were destroyed by the flood that God brought on the world. This is what scripture tell us, tells us. We have to connect God with bringing a flood. He did not leave that to anyone. When the cup of righteousness was full and the cup of wickedness was full, it was time for God to act and he destroyed the wicked by bringing a flood upon the earth. 2 Peter 3, 5, and 7, Peter goes on to say, For this they are willingly ignorant, that by the word of God, by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in water. What are they ignorant of? They've turned their back on God's word that explains that he is the creator of all things, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded by water. Who brought the flood? God brought the flood. If God created the earth, he's more than able to destroy what he has created. Not only that he's able to do it, he has a right to do it. He has a right to do it, and if he chooses to do it, that is his right. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, by the word of God, 
are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. So we read about this in the book of Revelation when this fire comes down out of God from heaven and destroys ungodly men, the destruction of ungodly men. Now I want to look at another, uh, another example of how God acts when the cup gets full. Genesis 18, 16 to 18. Then the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them and sent them on their way. This is when there was two angels, it looks like, and Yeshua came to meet with Abraham to tell Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have that promised son that they had been promised many, many years prior. And that was when a uh, then Sarah laughed thought God was joking. They had tried to have children for many years and never could have any. And uh, Sarah thought that was a bit of a joke. But God had promised and he would fulfill his word. Well, God was going to do something else as well. And Jehovah said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Very interesting. Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. This is a gospel promise to Abraham that if he remained faithful, many nations will be blessed and come out of his seed, and they would be blessed and he would inherit the kingdom. He said, look as far as the east, west, north, and south, all this land I will give you. And we go on to, to see here in Genesis 18, 19 through 21. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that, he, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Very interesting here. God has said... Shall I hide from Abraham what I am going to do? Well, the answer was no, he shouldn't. And the reason is, is because Abraham needs to know how God acts and reacts when things happen. Because God was expecting Abraham to do righteousness. That's what God does, righteousness and justice. You want to have a look at this word justice. It's actually judgment. It involves judgment and the execution of judgment. And this is what God was going to call Abraham to do. And we see this uh, in a few things. When, a when Lot was taken captive by the kings and they ransacked everything he had and all the people of the land, then Abraham was called upon to go rescue Lot. And that was something that God had, I believe, inspired him to do. And God expected him to do that. And the Lord said, because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down and see, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the outcry against it, that has come to me, and if not, I will know. Now, this is very interesting, a little bit confusing. Uh, in a way, I believe there's an answer to this, but why does God have to go check out Sodom and Gomorrah to find out whether what he's heard is true? Very interesting there. Some different ideas. We're not going to get into that, but it, I think it's a good question. What's going on here that God needs to go down and check it out. He wanted to check out Sodom and Gomorrah to see. This, uh, we want to look at this here, this verse, uh, Genesis 18, 19, the word that I was talking about. For I have known that he will order his sons and his house after him, that they will guard the ways of the Lord to do righteousness and judgment. This word is used in the New Testament by Yeshua. This is in the Greek now that I've taken this back. 
is in the Greek, this word judgment is 2920. You want to check that out. This has to do with executing judgment in a righteous way. There is a judgment that can be meted out and it is determined by God that it is righteous. And that's the kind of judgment that God is going to use in the time of the end, in the time of the very end, when God will destroy the wicked from the earth, and that is a righteous judgment. That is not deemed as murder. That is deemed as a righteous judgment because the wicked have determined not only to do evil, they have determined in their minds, and we're going to see this, when the evil ones determine in their mind to not only do righteousness and not turn from righteousness, but to persecute those that are doing righteous and make war against them. And this is what was going on in the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. The wicked had filled their cup. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before Jehovah. And we see a conversation here. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? You see, the question is not whether God is going to destroy the wicked. The question that Abraham that was asking, Would you destroy righteous and wicked together? You see, destroying only wickedness is a righteous act. But destroying righteous people with the wicked is not righteous. That's the question that Abraham is asking. Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy this place and spare it not uh, for the 50 righteous that were in it? So now the bargaining begins. Everyone knows the bargaining. And we know where that ends up. And we could look at that in Genesis 18, 25 to 33. We're not going to take time to look at that right now. We want to move beyond that because we know what that happened. It went down to 10. If there were only 10 in the city, would you spare the righteous with the wicked? Well, we know what happened there. In chapter 19, 12 and 13, And the man said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place? For we, who are these agents now, these were the two men that were with Jehovah, for we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of Jehovah. And the Lord has sent us to do what? To destroy. Now, the question is, are these evil angels or are they good angels? Well, I think if we really look at this carefully, we can see that these are angels of the Lord on his side. And we can see that throughout this story. So they're going to destroy this place. This here says, do you have any sons-in-laws? There were sons-in-laws. We know that by the way the story goes. And they had daughters. So it doesn't say how many sons-in-laws, but it's plural. So we know they had sons-in-laws, because it says they had daughters that were married, and they had sons -in -law, he had sons-in-laws. So that would be at least four people. We also know that Lot had two daughters at home, so that's two more people. And we know that Lot had himself and his wife. And so the eight of them, there was provision for the eight of them to escape. There wasn't ten. And Abraham's little negotiation he had only went down to ten. And there was less than ten, so God was going to destroy but it's very interesting to note that God did not destroy the righteous with the wicked. He called them out in just the same way that God calls us out of the midst of the wicked of this world. 
with, with the righteous in it, and God will not destroy the righteous and the wicked together. He will only destroy the wicked. Those that want to cleave on to wickedness, and he will always call the righteous out from the midst of the wicked. Then it says, Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Who does it say? Let's not twist this and make it say something. It's very clear. Jehovah rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah and from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew, he, God, overthrew those cities, all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and um, what grew out of the ground. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. I want to ask a question. Is God waited in the time of the flood until how many? Eight people were saved in the ark. He went down the same way, eight people. I find that very interesting, and these are examples, as we're going to see. Then he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain, and he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land which went up, the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when who destroyed? When God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham, the bargaining with Abraham, and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. Okay, so we saw in the bargaining with Abraham, Abraham would have known the size of Lot's family, and he took him down to where he was kind of, it looks like he was counting the amount of people that were in Lot's family. A couple sons-in-laws, a couple daughters that were married to them. He had two more daughters, and there was Lot and his wife. He got down that far to 10, and he stopped his bargaining. There were eight people that possibly could have been saved at uh, the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, but we know that the sons-in-laws scoffed at, Ab at uh, Lot and thought he was crazy, and so they didn't come out, and probably their wives obviously didn't come out then, and they were destroyed. They had chosen the way of Sodom and did not go out with Lot. And so only four were found in the city. And we know what happened to Lot's wife because she looked back. She was attached to the city, especially with family. Well, what a lesson that is. Don't look back when God says, flee. Jude 1 uh, verse 7 tells us, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner uh, to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, have gone after strange flesh, are set in as, a, as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You know, it just blows my mind. Everyone in the West, pretty much everyone in the West, knows when you say something about Sodom and Gomorrah, they know what you're talking about. It's like it's ingrained into the psyche of man, and yet they're playing with fire, the fire of Sodom and Gomorrah. They should really, when they hear something about Sodom and Gomorrah and how it was cast into this eternal fire, as it's talking about here, Sodom and Gomorrah, of course, is not burning now, but they are suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. In other words, the consuming of the whole thing. This is the eternal fire. It will consume all wickedness. And why did it happen? Because sexual immorality and the going after of strange flesh. Now, I'm not going to explain all of that. I don't think I need to. But people are doing exactly the same thing today in this world. And it's becoming actually legislated in the government halls of not only this country, uh, but uh, all of North America, 
and in Europe and abroad is that if you speak anything against this type of thing, that you will suffer the vengeance of the governments of this world. You see how we're moving into a place of total immorality and God, we're, we're actually forcing the hand of God in the direction of the destruction of the evil that's going on. But first, he wants us to see the evil that's going on and make a conscious decision to move away and flee from the Sodom and Gomorrah of this world. I also want to, um, want to say that it wasn't just Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed. It was the cities around them that were partaking in the same things that they were doing. This, all the cities of the plain, and we know that um, Lot fled to Zor because it was just a little one. I guess the unrighteousness hasn't been, hadn't been filled up. But the cities around Sodom and Gomorrah were also filled with sexual immorality, taking part in the same things that they were. And they were also destroyed um, by this fire that God brought upon them. Peter goes on to say that God turning the cities, I have injected God because the whole context of what God had done, God turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, God making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. And God delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations to reserve them, to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So God is going to preserve the unrighteous people to the day of judgment. How is he going to do that? Well, it's quite simple. It's for all of us to die once. God has declared in his word that we all are going to die once, and then after this, the judgment. We're going to look at that in the book of Hebrews. Very interesting point. God has called us all to judgment to die once. That's the natural death, the death that we die because of Adam's sin. We come to a ripe old age or somehow we, get, we might die ahead of time. We get hit by a bus or get a disease. We are all going to die once. And then it says, after this, the judgment. If everyone in the world repented of their sin, no one would die after that judgment that it talks about after we die, we're brought into judgment. If we all turn from our sins, then God's will would be fulfilled and no one would perish. However, we know the rest of the story that not all people will turn from their sin and God will hold them and will reserve them until the punishment that will be uh, unfolded upon them after the judgment in Revelation chapter 20. They will come up for judgment, and then judgment will be executed upon them because it says no place was found for them. And so they would not be able to inherit the kingdom that God had prepared for the righteous from the foundation of the world, and they would suffer the same ultimate penalty for their sin, the same destruction, as Sodom and Gomorrah and those at the time of the flood. That's why Yeshua in Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13 and uh, 14, and also in Luke chapter 17, where it's recorded that the punishment or the destruction of sin will parallel the destruction of sin and sinners at the time of the flood and also at the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. These are examples. These are examples when God takes the destruction of sin and sinners into his own hand. He does not allow the Nebuchadnezzars of the world to do it. He will do it himself because his judgment 
is righteous. His execution of judgment is righteous in his destruction of sin, uh, the evil angels, and those that choose to go the way of the evil angels. Genesis 15 tells us some interesting things. Then he said to Abraham, this is God now speaking to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants would be strangers in the land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. So this is God's people going down into Egypt and they're going to be inflicted for this time period. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. So God is going to judge that nation. And we can expect a judgment or an execution of judgment to follow. And we saw that in the destruction of, of Egypt and, and the Pharaoh's army. Afterward, they will come out with great possessions. So God's people will come out after they've been judged and they will have great possessions, uh, obviously because they have plundered the Egyptians. The Egyptians finally paid what was due to the slaves and they took out great riches when they came out. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Very interesting here. Same point. God could not destroy the Amorites as yet because their iniquity was not yet full. God's patience had not run out yet, but it would run out. Abraham was promised after the fourth generation. And we see what happened with Joshua. They were commanded to go into the same land and take possession. It came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard now how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, and he had gone to Jericho and its king, so he had done to Ai, Ai and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were mighty. Okay, so let's get the picture here. Joshua was commanded to go in, and uh, in most cases, he was commanded to kill every man, woman, and child, and beast. Wow, seems pretty severe to me. These people, their iniquity, their cup had been full. We, t we were told that when the iniquity of those people was full, when they had reached a climax and had decided they would not turn to God. Here, there's a really interesting text here that we're uh, just going to quote. The fear of the Lord is what? Somebody finish it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You see, these people were afraid of Joshua and his God because they had heard that he had destroyed Ai, which, had, uh, which was a great city. And now Gibeon was a great city also, and they had sided with the children of Israel. So they went to work and made a pact between these five kings, and they were going to go back and destroy Gibeon and Israel. They should have learned from the experience of their neighbors and sided with Gibeon, with Israel. And then there would have been no destruction. But they had come to the place where they would not surrender to the Most High. Their minds were made up that they would fight this God of Joshua, which would lead to their destruction. Therefore, Adonai Zedek, very interesting his name, Lord of Righteousness, King of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, 
king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Je Jephia, king of Lachish, and Deber, king of Eglon, saying, what did they say? Come up to help me and help me that he may that we may attack Gibeon for it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel this is a very interesting thing here this is a case where God was calling his people to the promised land don't miss that he was calling his people to the promised land and those that were in possession of the promised land made war with the children of Israel, those that were doing God's will. I would propose that that's when God is going to act, when his people are made war upon uh, of the people that are God's enemies. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, gathered together and went up, and they and all their armies encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have delivered them. Who has delivered them? I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Joshua therefore came, up them, uh, came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. So the Lord routed them for, before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon. Who did? Who does this say? So Jehovah routed them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon. Remember this now. Killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon. Chased them along the road that goes to Beth Horon and and struck them down as far as Ezekah and Mechada. And it happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent of Beth Horon that Jehovah cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Ezekah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones then the children of Israel killed with the sword. Now, let's just really focus on this. Who's doing the destruction? This sounds a lot like the destruction at Sodom and Gomorrah. God rained down fire and hailstones, fire and brimstone, on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And now he has uh, done exactly the same thing. He has destroyed these people with large hailstones from heaven. And it said that more died from those that God slew than Joshua slew. I would propose that when the wicked of the world make war against the saints, as we see in Daniel chapter 7, when they decide they're going to make war against the saints, this is only going to happen for so long until Daniel chapter 7 tells us Judgment is made in favor of the saints, and God steps in and takes matter into his own hands. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in that day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun stand still over Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Joshua? The sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not haste to go down for a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of man for the Lord fought for Israel. Now we're going to um, we're going to divide this study into two, but um, I would really recommend if you want to just go back over it and have a look because we're going to go deeper into this because now we're going to jump into the New Testament, find out what the New Testament Bible writers wrote about 
the judgment that would happen in the future, and we see the culmination, of course, in the book of Revelation. And there can be no question about who brings the, upon uh, the earth and the wicked the destruction, the destruction of the heavens and the earth, all evil, whether that be angels or, or man, from the face of all the earth, in order for God to uh, recreate this earth into its better than Edenic state. So stay tuned for next week as we're going to uh, finish this uh, and have a, a little bit of a closer look next week. All right, so let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll open it up for some discussion uh, for, for this. Father in heaven, we thank you again for your word that is very sure we can know for certainty what's going to happen in the future. And Father, we ask that you help us to understand the whys of these things. We ask you to be with us now uh, throughout the Sabbath and the coming week. Father, we ask that you continue to finish the work that you have started in us, that we would be saved from what's going to come upon the world. We pray in Yeshua's name. Amen.